Hi, I'm Leah Wheatholter, owner of Workman Forensics, and this is the Investigation Game Podcast. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. Joining me today is forensic accountant Tracy Conan. Tracy is a certified public accountant and holds the Certified in Financial Forensics and Master Analyst in Financial Forensics credentials. She is the owner of Sequence Inc. and works in Milwaukee and Chicago. After working in this niche for over two decades, Tracy is an expert in all areas forensic accounting and fraud investigation. I learned about Tracy when purchasing her book a while back called Lifestyle Analysis and Divorce Cases, Investigating, Spending, and Finding Hidden Income and Assets, for which the second edition has just been released. Thank you for joining me today, Tracy. Hello, Leah. It's nice to be with you. Having read your Lifestyle Analysis book, I just thought it might be fun to mix things up a bit today and interview a forensic accountant with experience in divorce cases, even though I know you have lots of experience in lots of different kinds of cases. But before we get into that, I'm curious, what steps did you take that landed you in this niche of forensic accounting? I actually came to forensic accounting uh, by a pretty direct route. I was a criminology major in college. And in my sophomore year, I took a class called Financial Crime Investigation. And it was taught by a criminal investigator from the Internal Revenue Service. And it was one of those courses that they offered once every few years as kind of a special elective. In taking that course, I got really interested in the whole idea of investigating financial stuff. And so I started taking accounting courses found that I was good at it. And I finished up my criminology degree. And then I went on to get an MBA. And during my MBA program, I used all of my electives to take accounting courses so that I would be qualified to sit for the CPA exam. And once I got done with my MBA, I started working at Arthur Anderson and had an interest in forensic accounting there, of course, but I was in the audit group and got a couple of fraud-related projects, stayed there for about 18 months, and then went on to a small forensic accounting firm where I learned the specialty of forensic accounting. And after a couple of years with them, I left to start my own practice, which was now 20 years ago. And I've been a solo practitioner the entire time. Wow, that is awesome. I don't know that I've met anyone to this point in my career that that is what they started out doing in college. Like <laughs> I want to be a for like forensic accountant. That is awesome. When I started out in the criminology program, I didn't know anything about forensic accounting, and my goal was actually to become a prison warden. Believe it or not, that was my true goal. And it wasn't until that sophomore year when I took the course that I found out that this career existed and then was really, you know, beelining toward the forensic accounting goal, even though at that time, it's funny, we did not refer to it as forensic accounting. It was just, to me, financial investigations. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. So interesting. I don't think I've ever met anybody who wanted to be a warden. Like that's incredible too. Tracy, you're so fascinating. That's I'm just weird. No, that's so cool. So out of all the cases you've worked over the years, is there a certain type of case that tends to be your favorite? Or if not, what just makes a case great for you? What I really like are larger cases that I can really dig into the issues either a case that has a really large amount of data or where there are some complex calculations that are needed. So I did one a couple of years ago where there was something on the order of, I think it was 8 million lines of data in Excel, and there were some calculations that they needed done. They needed something extracted out of this data, and it sounded simple, but it wasn't. And it required me to write a series of formulas, a series of if then formulas that built on one another. And so that's the kind of stuff that I really enjoy. I, I like cases where an attorney is looking for the expert to do their project, right? And so that's how I sell myself as a solo. If you've got a project and you want to know exactly who is doing the work, what you see is what you get with me. I'm not passing it off to staff. You're not going to get a team. So if you've got a project that you think is suited to a team, that's not me. But if you want to know exactly who's doing your stuff and it's a complex type of calculation, some sort of specialized issue or a complex tracing, that's my jam. Yeah, that's awesome. 
So since we're focusing on forensic accounting and divorce for this episode in particular, would you give us some of the backstory for your favorite divorce case that you've ever worked? My favorite divorce case involved a billionaire. So I call it my billionaire divorce. And in this case, they had a prenuptial agreement. And as anyone who works in divorce knows, uh, the prenup is never a slam dunk for it being upheld uh, when the divorce comes along. But this one they felt was pretty solid and had a really good chance of being upheld. But there was an issue because there were three small children. And so they needed to figure out what child support was going to be. So dad was the breadwinner, you know, had billions of dollars of assets. And they had these three small children and his wife came forth with a child support request of about a million dollars a month. And in this million dollars were a private jet, you know, really high costs for eating out, nannies, a house manager, really expensive vacation and things like that. And my task was to figure out what is the cost of the lifestyle of the children? I see. Okay. So that was your task. How did you get involved with this case? I already had a relationship with the husband's divorce firm. So they sought me out uh, to talk to me about this case. But of course, it was a huge case for them as well, even though they were a bigger firm, well-established. And so finding the right expert was really important to them. And so I went through several interviews with various partners at this firm. I had to go through interviews with the husband's in-house counsel for his company. I had to go through an interview with the company's litigation counsel. And so I had, it was a pretty intense process, Um, but ultimately my book, Lifestyle Analysis, is kind of what sold me to them. All of the attorneys involved got a copy of the book and kind of read it over a weekend and powwowed and said, okay, we like what she has to say. And that sort of was the selling point at the end of the day. Okay. So the wife was asking for about a million dollars a month for child support. How much or what level of income was at stake? Was it that million dollars a month or what were there other assets at stake? It was publicly reported that husband's income was about a hundred million dollars a month. And I'm not allowed to comment on whether that's accurate or not, Mm -hmm. but there was really substantial income at stake. And, you know, the interesting part of her argument in this case was that whatever she was asking for was just a drop in the bucket for him. So even though you and I might think a million dollars a month of child support sounds like a lot of money, that's a blip on the radar for him. So he should be willing to pay that. And his position was, I am happy to pay for my children's schooling. I'm happy to pay for all sorts of things for them. You know, he was happy to cover the cost of whatever it takes for his children to continue to live a privileged lifestyle. But he said, I do not believe that you should become enriched in the process. So, there was a process of us trying to figure out what spending is really mom and dad's lifestyle versus what spending is really the kid's lifestyle and what would be fair to include in that. So for example, when you think about them going on a trip together, well, if it's a trip to Disney for a week, certainly that's really geared towards the kids and that's the kid's lifestyle. And so we take that into account. But what if there is a trip, let's say mom decides she's going to go overseas to shop for furniture for some renovations that they're doing in the house. And she takes the kids along. Is that trip really the kid's lifestyle or is that mom's lifestyle that the kids so happen to come along on? And so those were some really interesting issues that we dealt with. You know, mom wanted to have a house manager. And while we looked at the issue of having nannies as directly related to the children, we said, is having a house manager really for the benefit of the kids or is that for the benefit of mom? If the kids already have nannies who are able to care for them during the day when mom is doing things, we're not certain that the house manager really is for the benefit of the kids. Yeah. So for this type of analysis, how much of the analysis you did was data driven and then how much of it falls into what I consider the expert piece where you have to give an opinion based on your experience. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's just in terms of my time, 
certainly, you know, the bulk of my time, you know, 80, 90% of my time was very data driven. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other smaller percentage was spent talking through what the issues are. You know, we had an interesting issue because mom believed that the kids should only travel on private jets because that's all that they had ever known. You know, she said, well, can you need to lease me a jet or buy me a jet or something of the sort? And we said, well, you know, there's a cost to that travel that is allocable to mom versus the kids. And we're not sure how we divide that. And so, you know, we spent time between myself and the attorney sitting around discussing alternate theories of how would you handle this? And one of the suggestions that someone made was, why don't we figure out how many trips a year the kids normally take and let's allocate first class airline tickets for that number of trips, figure out what that cost would be. And I said, you know, in a normal situation for, for a, for a normal person or even a normal wealthy person, that might be perfectly reasonable. But in this case, I mean, mom is right. Kids have never flown commercial in their lives. And I'm not sure that a judge is going to accept first class tickets as equivalent and as a, and is going to see that as a continuation of the same lifestyle. So we spent, you know, some time talking through these issues and it was super interesting because hey, how often do you get to do a billionaire divorce? And, you know, these numbers, I said, my mind got warped by these numbers. You know, what, what is a large amount of money or a small amount of money totally changes in your mind when you're working on something like this. It's like, oh, we don't know where that $10,000 went. Eh, no big deal. <laughs> Immaterial. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. I wanted to kind of go back because you talked about who's actually benefiting, the mom or the kids. And I feel like whenever I kind of started using that wording in my investigations several years ago, it kind of helped me do my job better. By looking at, instead of looking at good, bad, right, wrong, but just focusing on who benefited, made some of those decisions or, you know, providing advice or opinions or whatever a little easier because I don't necessarily have to judge anyone in order to give this opinion. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. So I, you know, I'm very often using the language who benefited from an expenditure, it doesn't matter what I think about that expenditure. It's just a matter of who received the benefit of that money that was spent. Yeah, I think that for me, it really clarified a lot several years ago. Okay, so with that level of income, I mean, the data, like you said, so much of your time was spent looking at data. So that the transactions and data must have been massive. So what were some of the steps that you took to stay organized and to make sure that you didn't lose or miss anything in performing your analysis? You know, I ended up with a database of uh, upwards of 40,000 transactions in it. And I had to know those transactions inside and out. I mean, we literally would sit in meetings and someone would point to one line item and say, what is that for? And I needed to know off the top of my head what they were for. And I sort of amazed myself at my ability to recall these transactions and what they were for. You know, not only in this case, but in every case, I use, I guess, three main ways that I stay on top of the data and the process. And the first is my document log. So that's where I'm tracking each of the accounts that I have to analyze and which statements we have by month. And so I make it sort of a little, a little chart that I can easily see what we're missing. And I also use the document log to track other documents that we need to get to make sure that we got them, make sure that I analyzed them and I can check off that I've analyzed them and such. So that's number one. Number two is when I put together my database of transactions, I have a check figure in there that is constantly validating my numbers so that if I were to accidentally delete a transaction or duplicate one or inadvertently change a transaction, my check figure, you know, is going to pop up that it's, it's no longer the right number. You know, my check figure is zero. And if I see anything other than zero, I know I've changed something and I need to fix it so that I can backtrack in my database and roll back to where it was last zero. So that's my data integrity. And then my third piece of the puzzle is you know, my checklist of tasks. So I don't use work programs in my investigations, but I do have checklists that I use so that, you know, I'm making sure that I've done all of my steps. So in a case like this, the checklist is very heavily focused on 
what I've done with each account that needs to be pulled into the database. So, you know, I'm checking off that I've captured the data, that I've done my auto reconciliation of the data, and then I do a hand reconciliation after that as a double double check. And then, you know, my next step is merging that account into the larger database. And then lastly, updating my check figure for the new data that I've added. Following my checklist, really, that was something harder for me to get into because I work alone. And so I kind of always in my mind know where I'm at on cases. But when you get a bigger case or you have a period of time where you have more cases, it's really harder to keep track of all of that. And so the quality control dictates that it's better for me to keep the real checklist and actually check things off as I do them. We'll be right back to this interview. It's been a little while since we've talked about find money and divorce on this podcast, and there have been so many updates. I'll fill you in. Module one, get organized in your divorce is live. This is a work at your own pace in the privacy of your own home and start basic organization to prepare to find money in your divorce. This is where our data sleuths start every case. And now you can use our handy tools and techniques too. The module includes a step-by-step -step tutorial video, an interactive PDF workbook, and a dashboard to our Find Money and Divorce tools and templates. If you want to see this module in action, we have a webinar replay on our YouTube channel called First Steps to Getting Organized in a Divorce. The Get Organized in Your Divorce workbook is also now available as a digital download from our website or paperback from Amazon. All of these cool resources can be found at www.findmoneyindivorce.com. Welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, that's such a good point. When I first started hiring people, like the second time around, first time it wasn't really for real, but the second time around when I decided, okay, I will be an employer. I remember the analysts would just be like, okay, we don't know what you did here. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's obvious, you know, <laughs> like, right. doesn't this make sense to you? And so that's when we started having to, oh, I really need to create processes. And even to this day, if an old case kind of comes back up, if it's just too long ago, I'm like, don't even... Don't even mess with it. I'll finish it because there's no way you're going to know like what I did, even though I look at it, know exactly what I did. That's a great discipline, but it is difficult when I was working by myself. So yeah. And then the check figure, I just have to point that out too. just how many times you mentioned check figures, because I used to have an analyst who would put a sticky note on her computer and it just said in big, bold letters, check figure, because it would go to the review step and they'd say, where's your check figure? And then she'd be like, oh, you know, but it's so important. How can I trust, you know, not trust the analyst, but just trust the work that nothing got lost if I don't have a check figure. So, right. I mean, it's so easy to make a slip of the finger. So when I talk about my database, I'm actually working in Excel and it's super easy to inadvertently change a number in Excel and not realize it. By having that check figure auto updating, I'm able to, all I do, if, if the check figure gets messed up, I just start rolling back versions until I get rolled back to the one where the check figure is back to zero. That's really good. So in this case, did your role change as you worked on this case? It did not. No, yeah. I was brought in to be the testifying expert regarding the children's expenses and it stayed the same the whole time. You know, I did get, I guess there were additional tasks that were added, but they were really within the scope of what we originally talked about. So at one point there was this big question about how much are the nannies and the household help putting on the credit cards and submitting via expense reports and how does this relate to the kids? And so there was sort of like a special side project, but it was all still related to the ultimate question of what are the children's expenses? Mm -hmm. Okay. How long did this case take to resolve? The divorce was pending for just over a year before it settled. And my involvement was about 10 months. Okay. That's not as long as I would have imagined. So many of our larger divorce cases, I mean, they drag out like four years, five years. I think both husband and wife were very motivated to settle. And I also think that a factor in getting it settled was that the husband had the ability to pay large sums of money. So no matter what he ended up having to pay, it wasn't going to hurt him. It wasn't going to be felt. Where I think a lot of the 
the smaller divorces that we work in, what they're arguing about is something that literally makes or breaks them from a personal financial budget. We're talking about, you know, a child support amount that may cause someone to not be able to pay their own rent anymore, right? So I think that it was a little bit easier to settle in that regard. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Was the outcome of this case that they settled? They did settle. And my numbers were very instrumental in that settlement. You know, the the wife ended up getting what I believe to be a generous amount of child support. And ultimately, everyone was happy. You know, both parties were happy that it was just done with. Yeah, I can see that. When looking back, is there anything that you would do differently knowing what you know now, having gone through that process? I don't think so. I, I was really happy with how my work turned out, the pacing of it. It was a huge case for me, but I was still able to work on other projects while it was going on. So I didn't, I didn't cut off my normal revenue streams in favor of this case, which I think is super important if you are you know, small firm or solo like me and you take on, I mean, this was probably the biggest case I may ever have in terms of fees and such. But, you know, I, I certainly didn't want to, you know, let my other clients hang out there to dry and not be able to accept cases from them because one, I knew that once this case was over, of course I'd need my other clients. So it was good that I was able to continue on with other projects at the same time. Yeah. Well, and from the way you described your analysis too, I mean, you stuck with your process and procedures to stay organized throughout. So I would just think that that would help with all of that. I know that whenever we stray from our procedures for that one exception, (laughs) I'm so glad I have somebody on my team that says, "Uh, are you sure you want to stray from the process for this person? (laughs) And then I'm like, oh, you're right. You're right. Because it's going to mess up. It always does. So, So if listeners are staring at a divorce case of any size, like an you know, a forensic accountant, investigator, what would be one of your tips to them? Use fixed fees. You, you do talk about that a lot on LinkedIn. So I'm kind of curious about it if I can ask you a few questions. You can. I've been using fixed fees for 20 years now. When I started on my own 20 years ago, one of my, uh, my really number one goal was to start using fixed fees because I hated the hourly billing model. I hated tracking my time. I hated billing someone 0.1 hours for doing certain tasks. I hated clients looking at bills and saying, why did it take you that long to do that thing? And I just truly believed that I wasn't in business to sell my time, that I was in business to sell my expertise. And I wanted to make that that differentiation for clients. Yes. And I 100% agree with all of that. And I feel like when I was a sole practitioner, I could do that. It's when I started adding team members that I felt like we had to start creating some sort of, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're still kind of experimenting with how to do that. Because if you get a case, like we're handling one right now, where we're working on the defense of a civil suit. And so the plaintiff is really driving a lot of what we're having to do because we're responding. And, and that happens a lot where we know our process and we can pretty much tell you how much that part of the process is going to be. But it's all of the extra that doesn't get accounted for and has caused some problems in the past. So I'm curious how what you base your fixed fee on to be able to offer that? So the way you handle that is every time I quote a fixed fee, we have to put a box around exactly what services are included in that. Sure. And so in a case where there's going to be some back and forth and there's going to be, let's say I'm going to do a report and then the other side is going to do a report and then I'm going to have to respond to their report. I will do phases to my work. So the first phase is me analyzing the documents that you have in your possession right now and me doing a report on that. And so I won't quote the fixed fee until I actually have those documents in hand. I will not quote the fee um, based on you telling me there's X months of bank statements because I don't know how many pages there are. I won't even quote it. If you tell me how many pages there are, I want to see the volume of transactions. I want to see the quality of the statements, whether they're going to OCR well or not, et cetera. I have to have documents in hand and then I'll do it in phases like that. Like you said, every time, you know, plaintiff 
creates some sort of drama and you have to respond to it in some way, that would be another phase of work that you would put a box around. And in my engagement letters, I always have the fallback that if we don't agree on a fixed fee for a portion of work, then we will revert back to X dollars per hour so that I'm okay. kind of always covered because I certainly, you know, if, if some little thing go, comes up where I have to look at documents, new documents, and it's going to take me an hour, I don't want to sit there and haggle over another fixed fee, right? That, that just feels like too much trouble to me. So if it's a little bit here and a little bit there, I'll either bill it hourly or quite frankly, a lot of that stuff I don't even bill for at all. If, if the attorney comes back to me and says, hey, can you look at what they gave us and tell me if, if there's anything we need to do with this? And I spend a half hour on it, I'm not sending them a bill. I just don't. So yeah, I think when you have a team, you also have to work on the active supervision to make sure that the time that they're devoting to things is proper so that if new issues come up that they know, do we go down that rabbit hole or not? Because that may have been included in the fee. It may not have been. So I, I'm pretty good at putting a box around not only, it only includes the documents I have in hand today, and it includes these analyses on the documents. And, you know, and I explained to them, and if, if I find something in there that is a new issue that we have to run down, then that's going to be a second phase of our project. Right. Yeah. And I would say that what you're describing, that fits what we call our data sleuth process. It's just when those things are outside of that, I've been trying to think, how can we just make all of this fixed fee? But I can brainstorm about that later. <laughs> Listeners may not want to know all about my thoughts on that. But I was very encouraged whenever I would see your post about fixed fee because I thought, okay, I'm not crazy. I think this is possible. So we're just still kind of working out the the kinks on that. Well, sure. And, and there's trial and error involved and you learn as you go along and I'm, I'm still learning. I, you know, I, once in a great while I end up, you know, with a fee that at the end of the day feels like I didn't charge enough, but for the most part, for the most part, I do very well. But when I started this 20 years ago, my fixed fees were nothing more than me looking at how many hours I thought a case would take me times an hourly rate and telling them that that was their fixed fee. So it's very unsophisticated. And it's over time that I've developed a way to calculate my fees. So I have a spreadsheet where you know, I have certain inputs in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, how many tax returns, how complex they are, how many transactions from bank statements. Um, am I looking at a general ledger? You know, how complex it is. And so I'm entering to the spreadsheet, these inputs, I'm giving them a rating for their complexity. And then my spreadsheet spits out what the fee is supposed to be. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the part we're still working on for us. I don't know if it's like this for you, but for us, if it's a divorce, some sort of a state case, uh, like a, a trust or corporate embezzlement, our process works. And so we can usually quote those. It's all the other, all the other things that don't necessarily fit, but right. so we're working on it. We're working on it. So I'm going to get there, Tracy. We're going to be, we'll <laughs> we're going to get there. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story and your knowledge if a listener has not followed you or connected with you on LinkedIn, would you just tell them how to do that or any other places that they can connect with you? So LinkedIn, you can find me by searching for Tracy Conan or Sequence Inc. Forensic Accounting. Um, I've got uh, uh, sequenceinc.com is my website. I've got a blog there where I write about fraudy kind of stuff. A lot of it's practice management tips or how to do investigation type of stuff. Once in a while, it's more current events type of stuff. And my take on things is, you know, if there's a current event fraud issue or something like that. Mm -hmm. But those are the LinkedIn and my website are the two best places to find me. Great. And we'll put those links in the show notes. So thank you so much again. I really appreciate you talking with me and look forward to learning more from following you on LinkedIn. So, and maybe we'll have a chance to meet in person one of these days. Well, thanks for having me. And I do definitely think we will meet in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. The Investigation Game Podcast is a production of Workman Forensics. For more information about the topics we discuss on each episode, please visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. You can also connect with us on any of the social media platforms by searching Workman Forensics. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for the podcast, 
please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com. <laughs>